Hello, welcome to your favorite health program right here on Ebru TV. You're watching My Doctor Show and my name is Purity Museo. And what we are going to discuss today, most women have been there and others are still there. Sometimes you feel distracted, whether seated or standing right down there. Maybe because of some smell that is funkier than usual or even some itchiness. Remember, this is not the, the end of the world because we have solutions for you. We are talking about vaginal infections and Dr. Charles Moriuki will be helping us understand what causes vaginal infections, what are some of the symptoms and how they can be treated. So I'll ask you to be part of the show. Call us live. As usual, the number will be displayed right at the bottom of your screen or subsequently talk to us via our social media platform on Twitter at EbruTV. Kenya and at purity underscore Museo. use the hashtag my doctor or drop your comment or your question on our social media on our Facebook a platform rather and time for my doctor show today we talk about vaginal infections the number is 0791 use that number to call us live and ask us a few questions do you have some of the uh, symptoms rather for vaginal infections we'll be having a look at some types of vaginal infections and what could be the causes and most importantly the treatment journey for that use the hashtag my doctor to talk to us on twitter at every tv kenya and at purity underscore myself and now help us welcome our special guest to the show today dr charles Moriuki. thank you so much for coming we appreciate welcome to my doctor show thank you for having me here Yes. Now let's get straight to our discussion today of vaginal infections. When we talk about vaginal infection, what exactly are we talking about? Is it just one type of infection or how do you define that? So maybe I think the best thing would be first and foremost to talk about uh, what is normal and abnormal. Mm. But a vaginal infection basically is an abnormal uh, presentation of the vaginal discharge that sometimes causes symptoms. And the infection can either be caused uh, by a bacteria or other organisms. But I think it's important to first and foremost emphasize what is abnormal. Mm. Um, sorry, what is normal? normal a right. normal vaginal discharge usually is clear in color, uh, does not have any smell. Sometimes it may be cloudy and the amount might vary depending on the menstrual cycle, at what stage a woman is at uh, the menstrual cycle. So anything that deviates from that would be considered abnormal. Mm. So any <coughs> change in the color of the vaginal discharge, uh, if the vaginal discharge does have an offensive smell, or if it is increased uh, an amount that is significant, then that would be considered as abnormal. Mm. Yes. And what again did you say is the color for a normal vaginal discharge? It's usually clear or colorless, mm. yes. Okay, now uh, f let's now get to the abnormal part of it, for example, and also some people will have, uh, let's say, tumors and all that. Maybe you could also take us through what a normal vagina is like, not only about uh, the, the discharge, but also just the structure of it and how maybe the length, how long do we expect it to be? What is the normal structure of a vagina like? Okay, so mm. a vagina, the vagina is a muscular tube that uh, would say it collapses on itself. And uh, um, uh, the structure in it is made up of what you call the mucosa and the epithelium. So the, the, um, there are some glands that are usually uh, located around the vagina, and those are the glands that are uh, responsible for the secretions. And these secretions are usually, as I said, clear, in a sense that these secretions usually flow from outside, and the vagina is, uh, in a sense, self-cleansing. So if at all there's any breach in the uh, mucosa of the vagina, then there is an infection that causes what we call inflammation. Basically, what people would sense is that there's some bit of pain or irritation, and this, and this is usually uh, as a result of the infection. So we usually don't talk about <laughs> standard size because mm. people are different. Yeah. And, uh, uh, and it's very difficult to ascertain what is normal and abnormal in terms of length. What we know is that there are other conditions that uh, genetically or congenitally uh, some, a child may be born with an abnormal length of the vagina or absence, and that is considered totally different. Mm. So if you were to consider what is abnormal, we'd say that then an infection that uh, enters or breaches the, uh, the mucosa of the vagina causes uh, what is called inflammation, and that would uh, lead to the, sy the symptoms that patients usually present with. Mm. Uh, patients usually would complain of noticing an abnormal change in the color um, of the vaginal discharge. 
And this also varies from one type of infection to another. For instance, if it is a yeast infection, some women will report that they see what looks like a whitish, cardish, cottage cheese-like uh, discharge. If it is bacterial vaginosis, they might notice a yellowish uh, type of discharge, sometimes even white gray. So these are symptoms suggestive of a type of infection, but the only way to confirm this is to do uh, a specific test. Mm. Sometimes women might notice that there is an offensive smell. Mm, maybe, for instance, uh, what is called bacterial vaginosis. Some women might report that they notice that the, 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 the smell of the vaginal discharge is almost like a f fish, a fish or fishy odor discharge. And that kind of smell is what is characteristic of that type of an infection. Um, so there are various symptoms that might point to a certain type of infection. Mm -hmm. and, but and because most of the times the issue of the abnormal discharge really uh, comes in when it comes to vaginal infections. Just before we could have a look at different types of vaginal infections there are and their specific symptoms, do we have a typical symptoms of a vaginal infection, whether it's candidiasis or chlamydia, do we have typical or each infection will come with their own uh, specific symptoms? I'd say most, uh, the, the each infection will come with a certain type of mm. uh, symptoms. But generally speaking, there will be an abnormal vaginal discharge which is, has a color that is different from what you describe as normal as clear or uh, slightly cloudy. There would be uh, sometimes the smell in the vaginal discharge. Some infections like a yeast infection doesn't usually have a bad smell. There would be uh, some form of irritation. And irritation means uh, any, any, any touch or sensation uh, usually is heightened. For, in, for instance, some women might report that they might have some bit of pain when passing urine or even have pain during intercourse. And this is usually during the initial phase of intercourse that they would report that they have that type of pain. And the reason is because the breach of the, uh, of the inner lining of the vagina is uh, more or less broken by the infection, and that causes pain. So those are the general symptoms. Sometimes women might just feel um, some bit of itching, uh, and that is mainly with a yeast infection. And for some types of vaginitis that we usually don't call them infectious, the other symptoms that people might have, for instance, they might say they used a certain type of a cream or a certain type of a vaginal douche, and they noted it's almost like an allergic reaction, some bit of itching, yes. Mm -hmm. And now let's uh, get to the causes. You said it's a bacterial infection, but what, is there a known cause for vaginal infections? So vaginal infections are caused by different types of uh, organisms. Some are bacteria, others are not. But maybe I would start by the commonest, which most women sometimes complain about, uh, and that is a, a yeast infection, or what you call a candidiasis, vaginal candidiasis. Um, and most often than not, somebody who has vaginal candidiasis will complain about uh, the whitish uh, discharge. It looks like uh, sour milk or mala, if I may use that word. Mm. Um, and m sometimes it might be that itching, okay? usually doesn't have an offensive smell. Um, what causes um, uh, candidiasis or even a vaginal infection? Usually the vagina is um, maintained at a certain pH. Okay? And if, for instance, there is a change in the bacteria uh, in the vagina, which is called lactobacilli, then there will be a change in the pH because the lactobacilli actually maintain the pH around 4, 4.7. So if, for instance, somebody has taken antibiotics, the good bacteria in the vagina is cleared, okay? Or if they use medicated soaps uh, around the vaginal area, that will clear the good uh, bacteria. Or if for one reason or the other, the immunity is low. For instance, they have diabetes or there is HIV, then there's a tendency to have a change in the bacteria that is protective. So once there's a change in the bacteria that's protective, then the pH of the vagina is increased and that causes other organisms that usually would be prevented from growing by the good bacteria to now cause an infection. And one of these is the yeast infection. So with the yeast infection, as I said, there would be that whitish discharge. There would be some form of itchiness as well. For bacterial vaginosis, what we call uh, uh, anaerobes are just other types of bacteria that would tend to grow because uh, the lactobacilli, as I said, has been eradicated by 
uh, other other causes that I made mention about either either the antibiotics. So these are decreased. So with this uh, bacterial vaginosis, women will usually report uh, a grayish white uh, kind of discharge, and will have that smell that like like fish. It's like a fish uh, odor, and again, that's a characteristic type of uh, a bacteria. So the yeast infection is what we call candidiasis. Sometimes it's this bacteria that mm. causes bacterial vaginosis. Sometimes you may actually have a vaginal infection that uh, is sexually transmitted. And this is uh, most of the times what we call uh, trypanosomiasis. Usually uh, people report about um, or trichomonasis, trichomoniasis, which usually reports, women report having a, a greenish uh, kind of a discharge that is also offensive in nature. But this one is specifically sexually transmitted. So there are vaginal infections that are not sexually transmitted mm. because of a change in the protective bacteria in the vagina. Mm. There are some vaginal infections that are sexually transmitted, like uh, uh, trichomoniasis. And there are some vaginal infections, or what we call vaginitis, that have nothing to do with an infection or, or bacteria or anything. It's basically uh, most like an allergic reaction because of using strong douches, uh, allergens, uh, some spermicides can cause that. And then there's a small category of women who will experience uh, some form of vaginal itchiness or irritation. Mm. And this is courtesy of the hormonal changes that come with age. Women who have already had menopause. Because the estrogen in the body or from the ovaries is what maintains the good bacteria to grow, if it is decreased for one reason or the other, say her ovaries are removed uh, during surgery or menopause has you know, kicked in, then this protective bacteria does not grow because there is lack of estrogen. And this inner lining of the vagina becomes very thin and some women will notice some bit of spotting or some irritation. Mm. So the way you treat it is really dependent on what uh, is causing this. Some tests might need to be done or based on symptoms, somebody might actually have an idea of what what treatment needs to be mm -hmm. instituted. And, and doc, vaginal infections are really common and every, almost every woman at some point in their lives they have had one of, or two of these infections. Do we have some predisposing factors to that? I'd say some of these predisposing factors um, uh, I made mention of. Mm -hmm. Firstly, there is the use of antibiotics. Um, antibiotics are meant to kill good bac bad bacteria, but we know that in the vagina there is good bacteria. Mm -hmm. For one reason or the other, and I think it's also prevalent in our society, that many people usually just walk across a pharmacy, get antibiotics, even when we know it's a flu. Somebody has a cough that is most likely a flu-related, but they take antibiotics. Mm. And Doc, you will allow me to cut you short? Yes, that's fine. All right. Mm -hmm. Flora is online. Hello, Flora. Flora. Hello. I hope she's going to call back. Okay, we can continue with the factors. Yeah, so we were saying that in our society, <coughs> taking antibiotics is a bit more uh, prevalent than we'd expect because they're easily available, which is uh, uh, not recommended. So if uh, antibiotics are taken and they're probably not necessary, or if they're necessary, because sometimes you actually do need the antibiotics, the good bacteria in the vagina, the lactobacilli, is destroyed or killed. So that uh, reduces uh, the protective effect and uh, predisposes a woman to having uh, an, an infection. Apart from antibiotics, there's also um, a, a use of um, an antiseptics uh, around the vaginal area. That also has the same effect of reducing the protective bacteria. Some women practice douching or bubble baths. This also puts women at risk of, of getting um, such infections. Mm. There are people who their immunity is low, for instance, people with diabetes uh, or HIV, their immunity is low, so they are at risk of getting a vaginal infection more than others. Mm. Again, uh, because there are, but there, there are infections, um, there are basically vaginal, vaginal infections is one of the components uh, in the sense that there could be a change in the bacteria, but there's also the the, the infections that are sexually transmitted. So women who are sexually active that don't mm. and don't use uh, um, protection in the sense of uh, condoms or what mm. you call barrier methods are at risk again of mm. uh, vaginal and infections. And allow me, doctor, to interject. I think yes, Flora right. is back now. Hello, Flora. 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 Hello
Hello. Hello, hi. Hi, it's um, Laura. Yeah. Kindly to ask the doctor. Mm. Go ahead. Hello. Yes, I can get you clearly. Go ahead. Okay, kindly to ask the doctor. Mm -hmm. My urine is yellow in color. Mm -hmm. Is there any problem? Okay. Hello. Yes, I've heard you. Okay. My my urine is yellow in color. Mm -hmm. So I'm asking a doctor if there's any problem because I don't think it's normal. Okay. But uh, Okay. Thank you so much, Flora. She's asking about uh, her urine. It's yellow in color, whether it's a problem. So we know that urine is uh, usually, uh, if it's concentrated, then it would be yellow in color. What we need to know is, does the urine have a foul smell? Because the color in itself might not give us much information. Probably we need to know, does the urine have a foul smell? Or does she have other symptoms uh, that are suggestive of, of a urine tract infection? Either pain when passing urine, or a feeling that she needs to rush to the toilet, or uh, if at all um, there is pain in the lower uh, part of the tummy, mm -hmm. or having to pass urine more frequent than, than usual. Mm -hmm. Though again, we, we also have to state that there could be other causes uh, uh, of that. So it's probably prudent for her to have a check and have the urine tested. Okay, let's now get down to the types, the common types of uh, vaginal infections we have. I don't know which one do you want us to start with, candidiasis? Yes, we, mm. we started with candidiasis. And again, I said um, candidiasis is caused by uh, a yeast infection called uh, candid candida albicans. And it's as a result of the reduction in the protective bacteria called lactobacilli in the vagina for reasons stated earlier either the uh, use of antibiotics that clears the protective bacteria, use of antiseptics that clears the protective bacteria, or what we call douching. Sometimes women uh, might feel they want to be super clean, and this is one of the challenges that we have as well. Mm. The attempt to be super clean actually makes things worse. So using uh, vaginal douches are not recommended, or using even plain water and flushing the vagina with plain water actually reduces the protective bacteria and makes uh, an infection worse. Mm. So when the yeast overgrows, then there is actually that change in the, in the discharge and it becomes whitish, almost looking like, uh, uh, like carded milk. Um, and there is usually itching, okay? And the yeast infection is not sexually transmitted. I think sometimes there is concern that, you know, uh, the, that the male partner might have such kind of a, uh, a, a symptom and maybe it was sexually transmitted. Usually a yeast infection is not sexually transmitted. Mm. So when that happens, uh, most often than not, uh, then when somebody does see the doctor, their gynecologist, they would be recommended to um, either be treated empirically or actually have an examination and a test uh, done to actually confirm that what uh, is seen um, is actually a yeast infection. Mm -hmm. And the remedy is usually tablets that you know would be swallowed once, uh, or pessaries that would be inserted maybe for three or seven days. Sometimes even a cream can be given that reduces uh, the itchiness. Mm -hmm. Yes, but importantly, is to reduce the uh, the risk of recurrence. So, I think it's also important to know what could be causing that uh, yeast infection to, mm. to 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 occur. Yes. Okay, and, and I think we can now uh, break them down to sexually transmitted and non-sexually transmitted uh, uh, vaginal infections. We've started with candidiasis. Does it fall under sexually uh, transmitted or non-sexually transmitted? Candidiasis is non-sexually transmitted, mm -hmm. yes. And we have more non-sexually transmitted or the other group lies now in the sexually transmitted. Another type of uh, vaginal infection that's non-sexually transmitted is what we call bacterial vaginosis. Mm. So uh, uh, the, the risk factors that lead to bacterial vaginosis are pretty similar to the ones that cause candidiasis. Again, it's a reduction in the protective uh, bacteria called the lactobacilli. And then there is bacteria that tends to overgrow and gives about this uh, uh, grayish white type of discharge together with uh, that, that smell that is offensive, uh, like, uh, like fish. Mm. So most often than not, uh, <clears throat> women will come with these symptoms and again, uh, depending on uh, what they present with, uh, ideally a speculum examination would be done by the gynecologist 
to actually confirm this type of discharge. And actually a test is, is also taken, a, a swab is taken, what is called a vaginal swab, and taken to the lab for analysis. And um, again, the treatment is usually a one-off uh, medication that, uh, uh, that can be given, or even uh, five or seven day course. Uh, but again, the risk factors is what we probably need to emphasize mm. to, to reduce the recurrence of bacterial vaginosis. Um, another type of non-sexually transmitted, but happens because of hormonal changes, mm. is what we talked about uh, uh, regarding women who probably are menopausal. And they might have an itch uh, or some bit of spotting or some bit of discomfort. And this is because of uh, the estrogen in the body being low, courtesy of having gone into menopause. And uh, the estrogen being low, again, the protective bacteria is reduced. Mm. So such women, most of the times, will come. And the key thing is to know that most likely they have already gone into menopause. So for, for such, the treatment is actually different. They don't need antibiotics. They need an estrogen cream that will be able to help uh, the growth of the inner lining of the vagina and reduce the risk of, of such infections. Mm -hmm. There are people who have what is called an infectious vaginitis, and these are people who use vaginal creams, douches, um, or even spermicides that could behave almost like an allergic reaction. So some of these are not recommended, but may be fancy because they're out there in the market and probably uh, maybe their friends are using uh, such kind of douches. And what happens is that some sometimes when people use these types of creams and douches, then they get an allergic reaction. And actually the treatment, again, most often than not is just to stop uh, those douches. Mm. Um, so those are the non uh, non-sexually transmitted vaginal infections. Mm -hmm. and, and Doc, I'll ask you, because you say that they are uh, not sexually uh, transmitted or they are not sexually transmitted infections, then let's look at the risk factors. This means that anyone can get the infections, including the, the, the young children, the young girls, right? So what are the risk factors? Because many people believe that hygiene has a hand in this. Yes, again, we did emphasize this uh, uh, in our previous segment about uh, perennial hygiene, and we emphasize that young girls should be taught how to clean themselves from front backwards, because that reduces the risk of uh, bacteria from the stool actually contaminating the vagina or even the urethra, okay? So per perennial hygiene is important, but I also want to emphasize that being uh, super clean in quotes is actually uh, more, more, more hazardous. Basically, it would also cause the same kind of uh, issue, because Sometimes people feel they need to clean themselves on the inside, what is called douching. Mm. And this actually needs to be discouraged because, well, as we said, the vagina is self-cleansing in the sense that the secretions that are produced usually would remove uh, any harmful uh, bacteria. But the attempts to clean and remove any type of you know, uh, discharge that actually makes it worse because uh, the good bacteria tends to be reduced. Mm. So one of the risk factors that I actually say is lack of perennial hygiene, mm -hmm. and secondly, being too clean in the context of uh, uh, practicing douching. Mm. Okay? Some might not be able to change the risk factors. For instance, somebody with diabetes, and I've seen um, a young girl who, uh, almost seven, eight years, who kept on having recurrent candidiasis. Uh, up to a point when he said, let's, let's check the, the sugar and actually see, only to discover that she had diabetes. Mm. And so this was actually the cause of uh, these recurrent uh, yeast infections. Mm. Um, sexual um, behavior that, you know, um, that might put somebody at risk is uh, either uh, sexual behavior that, you know, one does not use barrier methods or condoms. Mm. And Doc, can we hear from Carol? Yeah, that's She's fine. She's online. We can, we can hear from Carol, her. hi. We've lost Carol. I know she's going to call back. Okay. Yeah. So we, uh, we were talking about um, other risk factors, basically sexual uh, in nature that lack of use of condoms actually can predispose somebody to having a, a vaginal infection. Um, and that's why we emphasize that for people who are not in stable relationships, we encourage them to use dual protection, either hormonal method together with uh, uh, condoms to reduce the risk. Because it's only condoms that are known to reduce the risk of sexually transmitted infections and vaginal infections. Mm -hmm. But these are specifically for vaginal infections that are sexually, that are sexually trans transmitted. transmitted. Yeah. And I think I must emphasize that, uh, to be honest, most sexually transmitted infections 
does, don't cause vaginal symptoms. Um, and, and this is unfortunate because most women might either have chlamydia or gonorrhea, and they usually would not have symptoms suggestive of uh, a, 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 a vaginal infection. So most women with sexually transmitted infections will complain of other symptoms. It's in a few instances uh, and uh, where a woman would notice an abnormal vaginal discharge. Mm -hmm. So that we don't tend to point uh, that, you know, a vaginal discharge is equal, an abnormal vaginal discharge is equal to a sexually transmitted infection. Mm -hmm. So if a vaginal discharge presents that is abnormal, I usually would recommend somebody to see their doctor because based on the history, based on the symptoms that they're having and the examination and the tests done, mm. then the doctor will be able to know is this something that is most likely mm. uh, non-infectious or is it infectious in the sense that it's a sexually transmitted infection? Yes, and Dr. And now Carol is back. To do, yes. All right, we'll be looking at the treatment once we hear from Carol. Hello, Carol. Hello. Hello, hi. Hi. Talk to us, Carol. Yeah, I want the, the doctor to talk about trichomonas vaginalis. Mm -hmm. Hello. Yes, I can get you. Yeah. Hello. Yes, I can hear you. Go ahead. Yeah. You want um, the doctor to talk about? Trichomonas vaginalis and why it's sometimes resistant to some drugs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Did you hear her question? Yes, sir. All right, I thank you so question. much. Okay, let's respond to her first before you could forget. So tri trichomonas vaginalis is, uh, as I said, a vaginal infection that is usually sexually transmitted. And uh, most of the times a woman will notice, uh, again, an abnormal vaginal discharge um, that tends to be uh, yellowish in color or greenish sometimes, greenish yellowish in color. Uh, sometimes a test is done to actually confirm the, 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 that particular organism, mm. and that is uh, done in the lab. I think one of the causes of this recurrence, and partly is because of the challenges we have, is uh, the treatment. If one partner is treated for a sexually transmitted infection, let's say for instance the trichomonas vaginalis, and the male partner is not treated, then that uh, puts the woman at a risk of a recurrence. Mm. So f for any sexually transmitted infections, all sexual partners must be treated. Welcome back to the second and the last part of the show. The only chance you have to call us live and ask us a few questions regarding vaginal infections. There are sexually transmitted vaginal infections and non-sexually transmitted vaginal infections. Now we are looking at the sexually transmitted vaginal infections. The number is 0791-478-990. And feel free to call us and ask a few questions regarding vaginal infections. What's normal and what's not normal? Use the number 0791-478. 8990 on Twitter at EbruTV Kenya and at Purity underscore Mosio. Use the hashtag my doctor. Doc, welcome to the second part of the show. Thank you very and much. And we, we were still staying with the non-sexually uh, non, non transmitted infections. Do we have uh, some, let's look at preventive measures because I know these ones can be prevented. Yes. Yeah. What are some of the preventive measures for non-sexually transmitted infections such as candidiasis? So for the non-sexually transmitted vaginal infections, which are the commonest uh, cause of vaginal discharge as opposed to the sexually transmitted uh, vaginal infections, usually would recommend uh, reducing anything that would um, reduce the protective bacteria. So for instance, if somebody uh, might be um, recommended to use an antibiotic and actually when uh, evaluated by a doctor there's no need for an antibiotic mm. I would recommend not taking the antibiotic. And there was someone who was waiting for us to get back so that they can call. Let's okay, hear what they have welcome. to say. Yes, hello. Hello. Mm -hmm. Hi. Hi, how are you? Fine, thank you. And you? I'm um, okay. Talk to us. Okay, I was I wanted to explain to the doctor mm. Uh, that I have a young girl, three and a half years. Okay. Hi, how are you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm Mary. Yes. Uh, okay, I wanted to ask the doctor because I have a young girl who is three and a half years. Mm, Mary, just reduce the volume of your TV. We can get you from our side. Okay. Yeah, just reduce, then go ahead. Yeah. 
So I wanted to ask the doctor, sorry, I caught the talk on the way. Mm-hmm. And uh, I have a little girl who is three and a half years. Mm-hmm. But um, like the last one year, she has been complaining. Sometimes she can cry, Mama, so soon you chungu, but when I check, it's okay. So I wanted to ask the doctor, is, uh, can she be able to get the vaginal infection? Because I've never even bothered to take her to the hospital. Yeah, just hold on, don't hang up. Maybe Doc, you can use that camera and ask a few follow-up questions to get clearly what the child is suffering from. I, I think I've gotten clearly. Mm. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, thank you so much for your concern. Hmm, let's Maybe to respond to her, I think uh, it's, it's good that the baby is able to, or the child is able to complain that there is some pain, pain. in passing urine. That's basically pain when passing urine. And pain when passing urine uh, is most likely indicative of uh, a urinary tract infection. And especially, as we said uh, in the last segment, that young girls and women are likely to get a urinary tract infection compared to boys or men because of the short urethra. So I think it's important for this baby to have uh, a urine test done and probably a urine culture if this is something that has been uh, happening uh, several times. So the baby should be evaluated by a pediatrician. They should be able to at least get a sample of the urine and actually confirm that uh, if at all there's a, a urinary tract infection. Mm -hmm. It's rare for uh, a young girl to uh, uh, get a vaginal infection. And um, I think what the symptoms that she's pointing towards to uh, mainly a urinary tract infection. Mm -hmm. yes. All right, and maybe to help her once again, when it's, when it's untreated, do we have some complications? Because maybe she's been complaining for a very long time. Yeah, I think for... Uh, for a urinary tract infection, especially in, uh, in, a, young, in a young child that left untreated, can actually worsen and become uh, uh, a serious <coughs> infection that spreads to the rest of the organs and, and the rest of the body, what you call uh, urosepsis. But most importantly is before you get that, there would be uh, infection tracking up back to the kidneys, and, and this is not good because it potentially could damage the kidney. So I would recommend that it's probably better if the, mm. uh, the mother takes the child to see a pediatrician, um, have a full evaluation of the urine done, mm. and actually appropriate antibiotics are, are given to treat this. Yeah, and, and how long are we talking about if left untreated for one year? And also, do we have uh, some resistance in treatment once one again uh, left untreated for a long time? So this urine infection, I think the earlier the better, mm. because uh, the, the development towards uh, an infection in the kidney uh, can, can actually happen uh, in, in a short span, I'm talking about a couple of days uh, to, uh, to at least a week or so. But we would not want it to get there. Mm. So there are some times when somebody has been treated and this urine infection is not cleared. Mm. And that is why it's good to not only just do a test to see if there's any bacteria in the urine, but actually go further mm. and do a test to confirm of this, this bacteria that was uh, isolated or found from the urine, mm. which specific uh, antibiotic is able to treat uh, the infection once and for all. Okay, once. and let's receive one more call. Hello. All right. Let's finish up with the preventive measures so that now we can look at the sexually transmitted infections. Yeah, so we are talking about the preventive measures. So I would say avoiding the necessary use of antibiotics. Secondly, uh, if, if it is possible to actually avoid practices that are deemed um, acceptable but generally not beneficial. For instance, using bubble baths uh, and douches. Uh, sometimes there are people, and I must say that if they have recurrence of this uh, bacterial, of, uh, sorry, the vaginal infections that are caused by the reduction of the protective bacteria, there are some recommended vaginal washes and instructions are usually given on how to use it because they are just, the, the, the vaginal uh, wash is used on the outside, not on the inside of the vagina. So um, there's also the need to also be cautious about uh, sexual behavior. Okay, um, to, have, to use uh, condoms, uh, especially for people who are not in stable relationships. Um, some people have actually uh, tried home remedies. Sometimes people have tried using yogurt uh, or some form of uh, treatments called probiotics. Basically, probiotics are protective 
and good bacteria that help reduce the risk of getting infections. Mm. So these are also remedies that have, have been used. But generally, I think, uh, by and large, is avoiding being on extremes in the sense that uh, being super clean, which is one of the uh, challenges that we have, actually not cleaning yourself uh, properly, perennial hygiene that is poor, mm -hmm. yes. Okay, I think it's very simple to prevent the non-sexually transmitted infections, as yes. you say. But now when it comes to sexually transmitted infections, let's have a look at the common ones. And I know the cause is sexual transmission, but now what are the symptoms and what are the predisposing factors to that? Can okay. you just be sexually active but not get some of these infections? But just before that, my director tells me there's someone online. Hello? Hello? Hi, Frida. Hi, good morning. Morning, good morning to you. Okay, I am married. Okay. And if I happen to stay away from my husband for one week, mm -hmm. yeah, the next time I have sexual intercourse, mm -hmm. it's itchy, yani, kuwasha, yani. Okay. Okay, I kindly wish that my doctor could answer me. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Let the doctor answer. Thank you for your question. Yes. So, uh, as I said, some of the symptoms of um, a vaginal infection, sexually transmitted or not, could be irritation or pain during intercourse. So, I think um, that's a question that might be difficult to answer in the context of um, a, a phone call. Mm. She probably might need to see the doctor be able to take a proper history, get to know, uh, could there be uh, an abnormal vaginal discharge? Mm. Could there be some uh, irritation? Is there a smell? Has she been using some products that could be causing this? Uh, you know, has she been taking antibiotics? So there are several questions that might need to be answered. Uh, basically, if you take a bit more of the history, probably need to have an examination done by the gynecologist and mm. to know if there is an abnormal vaginal infection, mm. ab abnormal vaginal discharge or a vaginal infection, uh, uh, the test done and the, the treatment instituted. Mm -hmm. But I think it's important for her to see, uh, to see the doctor. Mm. Yes. And I think her concern was whether it's normal for the itchy a symptom after sexual intercourse with the husband or it, it's a cause for alarm or it's one of the symptoms for the many sexually transmitted infections there are. I would say it's not normal. So mm. I think it's important to, to have that uh, evaluation done by the doctor mm. and get to know is it uh, an infection that's sexually transmitted or not. Most often the vaginal infections, as I said, are not sexually transmitted. Okay. Let's now talk about the sexually transmitted infections. Yes. So we had highlighted that uh, uh, the commonest is actually uh, the trichomonas vaginalis or trichomoniasis that uh, tends to have that greenish uh, yellowish discharge um, that can be offensive. Again, just like any other vaginal infection, there will be pain and especially pain during the initial phase of intercourse that women will, will report. Uh, and sometimes there would be some form of discomfort. Uh, some might notice some bit of pain and passing urine. Um, other infections that are sexually transmitted that can cause a vaginal uh, discharge that is abnormal uh, is uh, chlamydia or gonorrhea. And uh, this, I must emphasize, are not the commonest presentations of chlamydia and gonorrhea. Most often than not, chlamydia and gonorrhea in women goes undetected. Mm. In other countries, they actually do screening of chlamydia uh, yearly or annually for young girls and women, which we don't have in our country. Mm. And some of the symptoms that chlamydia and gonorrhea uh, usually presents with uh, is very subtle. Some women might get some bit of fever usually pain during intercourse or just pelvic pain uh, or sometimes there may be no symptoms at all and then later on complications uh, uh, either regarding fertility or ectopic pregnancies that's when something like that is picked. Mm. So if at all there's an abnormal vaginal discharge that has been treated and is still recurrent, sometimes we emphasize that you know there's need to do more than just a repeat of another type of antibiotic treatment mm. or antifungal treatment. And a test can be done um, either in the urine or a swab that is taken from the cervix to actually get to know is there any chlamydia or gonorrhea. 
And these tests are available, uh, although they are a bit pricey, mm. to be able to actually get uh, uh, what is called the DNA segment from chlamydia or gonorrhea mm. actually in the urine. Yeah. And that, that will give us, it's much more uh, sensitive in the sense that it gives us much more information mm. uh, and is more accurate. Okay, let's yes. now get another call. Hello. Hello, how are you? Fine, thank you. And you? I'm good, I'm Joanne. Mm, John. Okay, Nikona, I'm total two, two years, eight months. Okay. I love one Jikuna, who is a private party. Mm. I took her the clinic. Mm -hmm. I was given the, some medicine there, but it's not, she's still eating, she's still under that one Jikuna, so I don't know what's the problem. Okay. Thank you so much, John. What could be the problem with the child? Yeah, thanks, John, for raising that, uh, that, that issue. I think the other thing that we probably didn't mention is that there are some children or some women who might actually have uh, what we call uh, vaginal valvular skin disorders. Mm. Uh, and these people might tend to have a history of or even allergies in their family. So they are skin conditions basically but now because they are located around the vagina mm. then they might actually be confused for vaginal infection and sometimes there's need for for them to be evaluated uh, by a pediatrician or even a gynecologist or a dermatologist to exactly know could there be a skin condition that presents like uh, uh, a vaginal infection because most of the times they will be complaining about itching mm. but there's no abnormal vaginal discharge so these are skin conditions that also need to be evaluated. Sometimes you also might have to be cautious. You know, for young children complaining about some subtle symptoms, you know, like itching and, uh, or, and other behavior that might point towards some form of sexual abuse is very key. Sometimes they may be withdrawn. But it's not good to just uh, assume that a child may just be saying they're having some itchiness or they're withdrawn and ignore that there could be something bigger. Mm -hmm. I think it's important to, to have an evaluation done by the doctor in, okay. and actually see, could this be um, a, a skin condition? Could it be something that's related to other allergies and actually have the effective treatment? Mm -hmm. It's not just fair enough to say, you know, a cream will be given. Okay. Yes. Right, let's finish up with the sexually transmitted uh, vaginal infections. Yes, as I said, the sexually transmitted uh, uh, vaginal infections are not as, uh, are not as common as uh, non-sexually transmitted vaginal infections. And secondly, um, uh, sexually transmitted infections don't usually cause uh, a, a vaginal discharge. Mm. In most women, it goes un un unnoticed. And um, if it presents with a repeat, uh, if a woman presents with a repeat uh, vaginal discharge, then probably, again, history needs to be taken and probably a further test done. Mm. Because chlamydia can actually cause uh, a very subtle yellowish whitish discharge. Uh, somebody has been treated previously for a vaginal infection, but it's still persistent. Um, and it is important to actually have a specific test done to actually confirm. Once that is done, for any sexually transmitted infection, all partners need to be treated. Mm. If you treat one partner and fail to treat the other, then there is a recurrence, there is a high chance that a recurrence will, will occur. Mm. So um, it's, a, it's not easy to actually have this discussion when there's only one partner. And it's important that actually this discussion is had in the context of mm -hmm. both partners if possible, and that both of them finish their treatment, yes. Okay, and what are the long-term implications for these infections if they go untreated? For the non-sexually transmitted vaginal infections, what actually happens is uh, there is a possibility of having you know, this recurrence uh, of the infections, which is one of the complications. Um, sometimes women who have had recurrent vaginal infections that are not sexually transmitted get to uh, have the nerves around the vagina being uh, super sensitive. And what this does is that uh, it now creates a picture where intercourse becomes painful. And this, we say, affects the quality of life of a woman. Mm -hmm. And sexual, um, uh, quality of life, to be specific. Yeah. So it is important that um, the infections are picked up and treated early to avoid um, a situation where the nerves of the vagina are super sensitive, courtesy of having repeated vaginal infections. 
for the vaginal infections that are sexually transmitted. Uh, one of the uh, complications that we usually um, see is damage not only now because the infection goes up into the uterus, mm. it can damage the inner lining of the uterus, it can also damage the tubes and actually even into the abdomen causing an abscess into the abdomen or what you call pass into the abdomen. But by the time it gets there it probably has damaged the tubes as well and this has a way of affecting, uh, basically affects the fertility uh, potential of a woman mm. and uh, women might not be able to have children or if they do get pregnant because of damaged tubes there's a possibility of uh, getting an, an ectopic pregnancy. Mm -hmm. So by the time you know it's sad by the time you get to such complications usually it's even if you treat the infection usually you cannot reverse damage to the uh, to the tubes or damage to the ovaries. Mm -hmm. So we would always emphasize that you know if there's any hint of any sexually transmitted infection then it should be treated and both partners should yeah. be treated. Yeah, and because most people tend to use the over-the-counter medication. Uh, from the doctor's point of view, do we have some home remedies or even over-the-counter medication for some of these infections? So, let's say home remedies for sexually transmitted infections are not present. Mm. I think that I must emphasize because sometimes there's an assumption that uh, you can use home remedies to treat uh, sexually transmitted infection. They, they usually require antibiotic treatment for both partners. For recurrent vaginal infections that are not sexually transmitted, uh, sometimes people have tried using what you call probiotics, mm -hmm. basically um, substances that will increase uh, the good protective lactobacillus or bacteria that uh, is found normally in the vagina. Mm -hmm. So sometimes people would use yogurt, uh, you know, sometimes people would use um, uh, some uh, probiotic substances or um, vaginal uh, washes that are pH specific. What I mean is that they actually tested and confirmed to actually have a pH similar to that of the vagina and it's actually used just on the outside, not, not on the inside. Mm -hmm. yes. and, and Doc, allow me to read a tweet. Someone is asking, each time I trim my pubic hair, Immediately what follows is itchiness and also abnormal discharge. What could be the problem? Should I stop completely? Yes, yeah, so this is again um, uh, regarding perennial hygiene. Mm. So uh, first and foremost, it's always important to know um, how best to take care of the pubic hair. Again, we usually recommend that people don't trim too close to the skin because sometimes that actually might damage the hair follicles and cause some irritation. So that is not sexually transmitted or is it, it's not a vaginal infection, but mm. per se what happens is because of trimming too close to the skin and damaging the skin, uh, then people do get uh, an irritation or an itch. Mm. And that irritation leads to some abnormal discharge? Or Usually it will not cause an abnormal discharge. Mm. And I think we might need to know what she is referring to an abnormal discharge. As I said, the discharge does tend to change depending on where the woman is in her menstrual cycle. Usually around mid-cycle mid ovulation, the, uh, the vaginal secretions are very light and thin. Uh, towards uh, the end, then they might be thick and maybe a bit cloudy. So it's important to know, is this abnormal uh, vaginal uh, discharge or normal? But the itchiness is perhaps due to the irritation and damage to the skin. Mm -hmm. yes. And uh, Doc, what I've understood from the whole discussion is that for the non-sexually transmitted infections, then hygiene has a big role to play or has a hand in this. And uh, now for the sexually transmitted infections, then both of the partners ought to be checked. Yes. Yes. But now what is usually, the, because sometimes it's like a blame game. What is, how does it spread from one partner to the other? We are talking about the sexually transmitted infections. And what is really the cause, the origin, if I may say, of the infection? Yeah, that's a, mm. it's, it's a question like uh, the chicken and the egg, which came first. Yeah. But the truth is, <laughs> um, we know that condoms are the only type of um, contraceptive method that would prevent sexually transmitted infections. That said that uh, any sexually transmitted infection will spread either because uh, one partner had it before and was not treated and has uh, spread it to their partner or either partner has multiple partners or both of them have multiple partners. So the challenge is once the treatment starts, we actually, 
if in a proper setup there is what we call contact tracing, then any sexual contact should be traced and treated. So if one partner is found to have, uh, let's say for instance, chlamydia, then uh, all partners that she has had should be contacted and treated. And, and, and the same applies. So what happens is a situation where one partner is identified, treated, the other is not, and other partners are not. So that infections, uh, type of infection tends to spread. Um, some people might actually say they might want to do further tests and get to know that, and I think it's, it's right uh, mm -hmm. just to confirm and know that this is a specific type of infection and, and somebody was treated. Mm -hmm. And again, it's, it's not just uh, chlamydia and um, gonorrhea massa, because even HIV is a sexually transmitted infection, mm. but doesn't present with an abnormal vaginal discharge. But again, we still emphasize uh, that consistent condom use is one of the ways to prevent uh, HIV, especially for people who are not in uh, in stable relationships. Yeah, yes. and as we wind up, I'll ask you whether on can all vaginal infections be cured, or do we have the notorious ones, the one that can never be cured? Um, I would say, uh, when you say notorious, probably I'd say recurrent. Mm -hmm. Recurrent. We said recurrent in the sense that there could be um, something that is being missed out. Mm. Okay, so could there be an infection that has been treated, but for one reason or the other, a woman has had uh, uh, um, uh, an exposure to something that will reduce the good bacteria. A small percentage, which is important again in this country, uh, is, is cervical cancer. Cervical cancer can present with a false smelling vaginal mm. discharge. And, and that is why we emphasize that for anyone who's had uh, an abnormal vaginal discharge, they need to be uh, seen by their doctor and a speculum examination done. Because sometimes it could be treated for repeated you know, infections, and people say it's a notorious, but actually mm. on confirming it's a bit too late because it's actually a growth on the cervix that is likely to be cervical cancer. All right. Yes. And now we have to wind up. We have to uh, end there. Thank you so much, Dr. Charles Muriuki, for bracing us with your presence. We appreciate it, but it's a conversation that we need to have once again. Thanks, thanks, thanks for you. having me. Yes. Sentence. And thank you for watching. Thanks for your comments. Thank you for your contributions. We highly appreciate. My name is Purity Musil, and my doctor show continues next week, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, same place and same time.